I said that we serve a mighty God. Amen. Amen. Come and turn to your neighbor and tell them it's going to be good in the house tonight. Tell them it's going to be amazing in the house tonight. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come and give God one more praise and take your seats. Praise the Lord. Amen. I am so excited to be here. I bring you greetings from London, England. Amen. I bring you greetings from the Queen. I bring you greetings from Boris Johnson, our mayor. I bring you greetings from David Cameron, our prime minister. Amen. I even bring you greetings from the Springboks because they're in London. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I bring you greetings from my wonderful wife, Nirai. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to be with us today, but I brought a picture of her. Hopefully, they can put it up on the screen. You know, we've been married now 22 years. <laughs> Amen. When I met her, I was 14 years old. Look at that picture. This was one year before we got married. 22 years married to the same woman. Somebody give God praise. Amen. And I bring you greetings from my children. I have four children, two boys, two girls. My son, Panache Prince, J Jamie Jr. My daughter, Tawana, Jordan, my other daughter, Dahlia Rose, and my little boy, Zachary Zion. Greetings from my children. Praise be to God. Amen. But as I begin today, I really must acknowledge the man and woman of God over this house. You know, I need to use that word, Moruti. I've been wanting to use it. Amen. Pastors, you're amazing people. And I don't say that lightly because in ministry, you meet a lot of different people. But I've met very few people like these people. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Amen. And I'd like to acknowledge the, the leadership of this church because you're doing an amazing job. From the moment I arrived at the airport until now, everybody has taken wonderful care of me. Thank you so much. It's easy to preach when people look after you. Amen. For all of the pastors who are here, all of the visiting pastors, I acknowledge you, Pastor Jade, and your wonderful wife. Thank you. This man puts me under pressure every time I hear him preach. I just said, oh my God, now I have to follow him. What a, <clears throat> what a difficult challenge. But I believe that the Lord has a word for you tonight. Amen? And my brother, John the Baptist. Oh, no, 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 no. The hand of the Lord is upon you. Amen? And, and if they call you the Limpopo Express, they must call me the Hauteng Express. I'm releasing my faith for that name. Amen. Please lift up your Bibles with me as we begin to get into the word today. I have a word for you from heaven. I believe that it will transform your life. I believe that it will take you to a new level. I believe that God has something in store for you today. Amen. Come and lift up those Bibles before the Lord and say this after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. This evening, I will be taught the word of God. And I boldly confess that my mind is alert and my heart is receptive. And I will never be the same again. Because of the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living word of God. Therefore, I declare in the name of Jesus that this is my receiving day. This is my receiving day. And I expect a miracle tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We glorify your holy name. Thank you for the awesome privilege of serving your purposes in our generation. Thank you that revelation knowledge will flow freely tonight, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Now, Lord, speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind, all of you, 
and none of me. Holy Spirit, we ask you tonight to glorify Jesus amongst us. Let every purpose and plan of your heart be established tonight in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. I have a word tonight which I have entitled, Keys to a Glorious Destiny. Keys to a Glorious Destiny. Before I, I, I even get into the word, I have a couple of products here. One of the books that I have brought is a specific book which was written for this conference. Amen. It is a book entitled, While Men Slept. And I believe it's a book that will inspire men. It is entitled, Rediscover Rediscovering excuse me, Your Purpose and Your Passion. There's, an, uh, there's a chapter in there entitled, Awakening the Sleeping Giant. Amen. And much of what, I, of what I'm going to share with you is from a chapter entitled, Keys to Your Glorious Destiny. But I also have another book here, and there's not many copies of this one here. This one is a devotional that I wrote with my wife. We released it earlier on this year. We run a publishing company in London, and we released this book earlier this year. It's a 31-day devotional designed to supercharge you as you pursue your destiny in God. We normally, uh, I know we sell these in London for the equivalent of about 180 rand. They're 130 rand for the conference. May God bless you as you get your copy. Amen. But let me begin as I get into the word today because I want to move in, in and, and quickly get out what God has put inside of me. Let me say this as I begin to share the word today. I have learned through experience in the things of God that there is nothing more powerful than the word of God. Are you understanding? One of the challenges we have in the body of Christ today is there's a lot of philosophies doing the rounds in the world. And the challenge with philosophies, they sound really good, but they cannot produce results. And so the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, 20 and verse 32, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. In other words, you have an inheritance in God, but the only way you will get your inheritance is through the word of God. Are you understanding? So everything that I'm sharing with you today is not human intelligence, but it is the word of God. Because your inheritance is tied to the word of God. Are you understanding me? I want to read a scripture as we continue today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 11 to 13. And I'm going to read this from the message version. Because it says something that I believe is so prophetic for this house and, and for this conference. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 11 to 13. In the message version it says it like this. Dear, dear Corinthians. Or dear, dear men of hope. I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness that you feel comes from within you. Your lives are not small, but you are living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. Come and turn to your neighbor and say, open up your life. Live openly and live expansively. Saints of God, it's important as we get into the gist of my message today for you to understand that you have a glorious destiny in God. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Every person that is here tonight has a glorious destiny in God. None of us are human creatures of earthly origin. We are supernatural creatures of a supernatural origin. When you see us being born into the world, that's not when our lives started. Are you understanding? If you, if you read the scripture in the book of Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30, the Bible says, And we know all that all things work together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. And then he says, For those whom he foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, those whom he predestinated, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Let me break that down for you. God says, your origins are not natural. Before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. That's what he said to Jeremiah. Before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and I ordained you a prophet. Somebody says, why is that important? Because if you believe that you were born on this planet, then you will be stuck by the problems that are afflicting this planet. But if you understand that you have heavenly origins, then the things that affect natural men cannot affect you. I said the things that affect natural men cannot affect you. Because you were birthed in heaven. 
God says, those whom he called, he justified. You are called by God. God called you, then he put you on the planet. And he said, you have an assignment, a unique assignment that only you can fulfill. Then he puts you on the planet and he says, now begin to live out that assignment. He says, those whom he justified, he glorified. In other words, this story is not over until I see some glory in your life. I said, this story is not over until I see some glory in your life. Come and look at your neighbor and say, you're not a natural person. Tell them again, you're not a natural person. You were birthed in heaven. Are you understanding me? And the moment you begin to understand that you deal with things differently. I hear people all the time say, oh, things are tough in South Africa. Let me tell you something. Things are only tough in South Africa if you live in South Africa. But I don't live in England. I live in the kingdom of God in England. Oh my God. If you live in South Africa, then the things that affect South Africans will affect you. But if you live in the kingdom of God in South Africa, then you deal with things from a vantage point. Oh my God. Because you're not natural. You're a supernatural being. Just like Jesus. Oh my God. Created in the image of God and designed to solve the things that affect mere men with a heavenly mindset. You know my John the Baptist today, oh my God, you are, you are under a special anointing, I want to tell you. Because you know what we're going to be sharing on today? David. David. Let me show you the scripture. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Verses 14 to 18. And I'm going to read two passages of scripture and then I'm going to break it down for you. Is that alright? Are you excited today? You see, I preach better when you, when you say amen. Amen. Even if you don't agree with what I'm saying, just say something. Say, mm hmm I believe. I don't agree. Say something. Are you listening to me? Say, Pastor, take it to the bridge. Say something. So that this word might come out. Because the more expectant you are, the more you will receive. If you came expecting a miracle, you will leave with a miracle. If you expected finances, you will leave with finances. If you expected healing, you will leave with healing. If you expected restoration, it's coming to your house. Say amen. Say amen. Say amen. First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 to 18. The Bible says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. He is a mighty man of valor. He is a man of war. Ooh -ha. He is prudent in speech. He is a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Let me tell you something about David that is unusual. When the Bible says that God had rejected Saul as king over Israel, God said, I have found a man after my own heart that I want to be the next king of Israel. The Bible says that he bypassed every single man of, in Israel and went to a little boy of 16 years old who was on the backside of the desert herding some sheep. Are you listening to me? He bypassed the brothers in, in, in David's house, Eliab and Abinadab and Shammah and the four other brothers that he, have, he had. And he said, I want David. There's something significant about David. And if we can understand what was unique about him and we can do what he did, then we can get the results that he got. Because the secrets of men's success is in their stories. So David, on the backside of nowhere, but God says, this is my man. And when the king has a problem that nobody can solve, they say, let's seek out a man. And they begin to list six characteristics about David that distinguished him from everybody else. They said, number one, he's skillful in playing. Number two, he's a mighty man of valor. Number three, he is a man of war. 
Number four, he is prudent in speech. Number five, he is a handsome person. And number six, the Lord is with him. Let me say something to you as I begin to break it down tonight. It is important for us to understand in the body of Christ that we need to develop skill. Are you understanding me? Because when you do not have skill, then you are limited to serving mean men. The Bible says, seest thou a man who is diligent and skillful in his business? He will serve before kings. He will stand before kings. He will not serve obscure men. Every time you find yourself serving somebody who is obscure, it's because your skill level is not at the right level. And the problem with obscure men is that they don't pay well. They make you suffer for what they give you. But when you develop your skill, the king will pay you. And how many of you know there's no limits to what the king can pay? You see, it's one thing to solve problems at this level, but when you solve international problems, you get international rewards. One of the greatest problems in the body of Christ today is everybody's running looking for a title. Like they say in Texas, big hat but no cattle. Are you understanding me? You have a 19-year-old boy who calls himself an apostle and he has two members and a microphone. You are not an apostle because you call yourself an apostle. Show me your skill. Are you understanding Diligence, skill, skill, somebody says what is skill? Skill is the ability to combine your knowledge and your experience and your training to produce something that is exceptional. When I went to law school, it took me four years for them to say you are now a lawyer. And even after I qualified every year, I need to go through continuing professional development. Because you keep getting better. If you are not getting better, you are remaining at the same level. Two years ago, the Lord gave me an idea. He said to me, I'm going to give you an idea that will transform the fortunes of the body of Christ in the United Kingdom. And then the Lord said, but you see, in order for you to go to that level, you have to learn a skill that you do not have. On Monday, when I get back to the United Kingdom, I land at 6.30 at 9 o'clock. I'm in class doing another master's degree. Next year, I have to go to Cambridge University to do another one because the level of your skill will determine the level of your results. You see, the reason why the body of Christ is being despised by the world is because we don't have the level of skill that they have. But somebody say, those days are over. Come and say like you mean it, those days are over. In other words, we're getting to the place where we are going to develop skill. Be very good at what we do. You know, the Lord said something to me. There is a value that we must now begin to understand. Every one of us in this place are valuable. We are valuable to our parents. We are valuable to our children. We are valuable to our pastors. But there is a measure of value that when you get your head around it, it actually is the most important value. It is called market value. It is what the market is willing to pay you for what you do. And the beautiful thing about market value, it has nothing to do with your color. It has nothing to do with whether you are Kosa or Vendor or Zulu. It has everything to do with your value and what you can produce. I hear people all the time complaining. It's hard in South Africa. I said it's hard if you are not skilled. Because no matter how tough it gets, people will find you out when they have a problem. When Pharaoh had a dream that he could not interpret, they found a man called Joseph. They said, this man can interpret the king's dreams. Notice, when you solve the king's problems, oh my God. The rewards are so big. When Pharaoh called Joseph and Joseph came up to him and he said, I know exactly what you dreamt and I know the solution for where you are. And Pharaoh said, can we find a man like this in all of this kingdom? I tell you what, from here on in, come straight out of the prison. I don't care whether you have any references. I don't care if your, your police check is messed up. Come to the palace. You are number two in the kingdom. Are you understanding? 
I hear people reciting in, in, in meetings. They say all the time, oh, you know, it's really difficult in, in South Africa. We have the highest Gini coefficient in the world. You know, the Gini coefficient measures the distribution of resources in a country. And when you look at that economic status, it will tell you South Africa's distribution of resources is the most unequal in the world. But how do you change that? By complaining? By toy toying? Or by developing skill? Until the place where they cannot ignore you. They say, they say all that, oh, how can they pay Ronaldo 300,000 pounds a week because of his skill level? Don't you know all footballers are equal, but some footballers are more equal than others? Because of your skill. Come and tell your neighbor, no more excuses. Tell your neighbor, no more excuses. When my father was 62 years old, he told me, son, I'm going to university. I said, how do you go to university at 62? He said, because I need to get a degree. There's something in me that is crying out and saying my personal development is suffering. 62, full-time pastor, working full-time. He went to university and got a 2-1 degree in accounting and finance because he decided to. Don't you understand? The place of decision is the place of power. Somebody say skillful. I need to keep moving because I've got a lot to say to you. Somebody say skillful. And this is important. God showed me that skill is one thing. It's you tra your training, your knowledge, and your experience. But it is also an anointing. Uh, in other words, when God finds you doing something he called you to do, he will put his super upon your natural and cause you to get results that no man can ignore. Undeniable proofs of his power. Are you understanding? When you read in the book of 2 Chronicles, the Bible says concerning Uzziah, and Uzziah invented all kinds of machines. I love what John the Baptist was saying about inventions and Mark Zuckerberg. Don't you understand that every one of those ideas, I believe that God wanted to give them to the church, but the church was not ready. The giants were asleep. And the Bible says concerning Uzziah, and God gave him all of these wonderful inventions. And then the Bible says, and his name spread far abroad. Until he became great, for he was marvelously helped. Are you understanding? Now, let me say something to you about the Spirit of God. God cannot help you if you are doing nothing. Just like if you have a wife, your wife is called a help meet. She is suitable help for your assignment. But she cannot help you if you are doing nothing. Oh my. And let me throw this in there whilst I'm on this. John the Baptist said that we need to learn how to pray. Are you understanding? You see, you see, if you, I hear men all the time, they say this. My wife is a prayer warrior. My wife knows how to pray. Don't you understand that the people who should be praying are the men? Last year, I met a woman in South Africa. She said to me she had been in the armed forces for 12 years. And she resigned from the armed forces because they would not let her serve at, at the front of the war. Are you understanding? But in the church, we send our women to the war front. <gasps> which one of the patriots, which one of the, the generals of the faith, Put their wife in the front instead of them going to the battle. Because the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a place of danger. But we send our women whilst we sleep at home watching Kaiser Chiefs. The Bible says concerning David that David was a mighty man of valor. You know what valor is? Valor is strength of heart. It is a heart that is so strong that it does not faint whenever trouble comes. Are you understanding me? Because one thing you must understand about life, adversity will come. Even when God opens a door for you, there are people who want to shut that door. The Apostle Paul would say, 
An effectual door of utterance has been opened for me, but there are many adversaries. Every time you make the decision to go to your next level, there are people and demonic forces that will try and suppress you. Every time you try and break out of the ghetto to go into Santon, there's a spirit in your family that will tell you you belong here forever. Every time you try and stay married to the wife of your youth, there is a spirit in your family that says, no, you must fornicate. And the only way you deal with that is to have a strong heart. Are you understanding? That's why in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, the apostle Paul would pray. He prayed that God would anoint you and strengthen you with might in the inner man. We spend so much time building our muscles in the gym, but we are emaciated on the inside. So when trouble comes, we are stuck. When Goliath is spewing forth vitriol against the armies of Israel, all of the men are fainting, including the king. And it takes a little boy of valor to say, not my God. <laughs> uh -uh, I've got a big heart. Tell your neighbor, enlarge your heart. Tell your neighbor, enlarge your heart. In other words, when trouble comes, I will be there. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. It took one word from Jezebel to, to Elijah, and Elijah started running. He said, if I catch you tomorrow, you're a dead man. And Elijah's knees started to have fellowship. Are you understanding? Because the size of his heart was not enlarged. When God spoke to the children of Israel and said to them, there is a promised land for you. Now go into the land. They said there are many giants in the land. And we are like grasshoppers. Are you understanding? When you see like yourself like a grasshopper, you will be condemned to eating grass for the rest of your life. And hopping Instead of flying, I love that. The size of your heart. Psalm 138 and verse 3, God, the Bible says, this is David speaking. He said, I cried out to the Lord and he made me strong with strength in my soul. Our hearts need to become bigger. Are you understanding? Because the wars are inevitable. The Bible says concerning David, number 3, that he was a man of war. Somebody say, a man of war. Deliver me from Christians who tell you that if something is God's will, then it will come easy. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The only language that the devil understands is force. Deliver me from the pacifism which is in the church, which says I want peace at any cost. The challenge you must understand about the devil is that you cannot negotiate with a terrorist. When God was speaking to Moses, he said to him, listen, see, I have given into your hands Sion the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. And then he says, now. Somebody say now. now. Say it again, now. now. Say it like you mean it, now. now. He says, now, engage him in battle and begin to possess it. The Bible says, God says, I've given you the land, but for you to get it, you have to engage him in battle and begin to possess it. Are you understanding? Life is war. That's why the first thing that the, the doctor does when you are born is to slap you. To say, welcome to life. It's a war. You have to fight. Are you understanding me? And if you're a sissy, you're going to fail. Oh my God. Since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by what? By what? By what? It requires force. 
for the devil to let go of you and your destiny. If you are lazy, man, you will never see what God wants you to see. William Shakespeare put it like this. He said, he said what? He said, a coward dies a thousand times before his death. But the valiant taste of death but once. Jeremiah 12 and 5, the Bible asks the question, if you have raced with men on foot and they have tired you out, how will you compete with the horses? Don't you know the devil has no problem with you being at one level where you are just getting by, having to go to work, to work for an obscure man who gives you just enough money so that you come back tomorrow. The devil doesn't want you to get to the place where you have savings. The devil doesn't want you to get a place where you have investments. The devil doesn't want you to get a place where you have properties all over the country. Where you can decide to go to work if you want to. He wants you stuck. Borrowing. Because the borrower is servant to the lender. But the Bible tells me, I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am blessed in the city and I am blessed in the field. I am blessed coming in. Come on, get excited now. And I'm blessed going out. I'm in a place of dominion. As he is, so am I in this world. As he is, so am I in this world. But you've got to be a man of war. You've got to fight for your family. You've got to fight for your marriage. Nehemiah said it like this. He said, if you don't have the motivation to do it for yourself, then do it for your wives. Do it for your children. Don't you know that your wife wants a better life? She's with you because she loves you. But she wants a better life. She doesn't want to bath in, 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 in fairy liquid with bubbles that are supposed to be washing the plates. She doesn't want you to be the one doing her hair because you're trying to save money. And the lady said, until we win and that's why the bible says fight the good fight of faith are you understanding even when you have received a prophetic word the bible says you must contend for the prophecies that were spoken over you the reason why we don't get things that belong to us is because our attitude is laissez faire if god wants to do it then he will do it but let me tell you something any faith that puts the responsibility for your life entirely on God is an irresponsible faith. In other words, you have your part to play and God has his part to play. Until you pay your part, God is not committed. Listen, man of war, man of war, Life is a fight, gentlemen. Mike Meadow put it like this. He says, you cannot avoid war. You must just learn how to fight. And that's why the Bible says in the Psalms, teach my fingers to make war. Oh my God. Are you understanding? You got to get to the place where you say, God, give me the wisdom. Make my heart big. Help me so that I can do the things that you have called me to do. Because aren't you tired of having a name that nobody knows? If I, if, I, if I say to you right now, Cristiano, what name comes to mind? If I say Lionel, what name comes to mind? And some of you are saying Messi, but your name is Lionel. The 
The Bible says it like this. Oh my, come on, listen. By redemption, you are a partaker of the Abrahamic covenant. Are you understanding? And God spoke to Abraham and he says, I will make your name great. In one translation, it says, I will make your name famous and distinguished. God has no problem with you having a great name. He just wants to be involved. <laughs> Are you listening? A great name. When I say Nelson Mandela, he's a great man. What about us? What's wrong with us? Don't we have the same covenant? Don't we bleed red just like he bled? What's wrong with us? That's keeping us grounded. Accepting things that are so below where God wants us to be. Can I tell you something? One of the reasons why I'm a Christian is because I believe in God, number one. But I also believe in his church. And I'll tell you why. Because God said it like this. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Are you understanding? If God believes in the church, then so do I. And the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verse 2, that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord shall be established above every other mountain and it shall be exalted above the hills and all nations will flow into it. And they shall say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he might teach us his ways and we might walk in his paths. The Bible says that in the last days, the church will be the single greatest institution that the world has ever known. Are you understanding? But we got to build it one person at a time. God wants us dominating the politics. He wants us dominating business. He wants us dominating education. He wants us dominating arts and media. But we got to gird our loins like men and stop being sissies because the world is looking for answers that we have. Are you understanding? We tell people, come to church, come to church and God will fix your problems. And then they come to church. But because we are not engaging with God at the right level, they're not getting the results they need. It is an indictment on us because we are the ambassadors of Christ. The Bible says concerning David, and I'm getting to a close here, but the Bible says concerning David that he was prudent in speech. A German philosopher by the name of Ludwig said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. People don't understand how important language is. It is said that there are 400,000 words in the English language. The average person uses 400. And then they fill in the gaps by swearing. So anytime somebody comes up to me and they start swearing, I say, you're finished, right? Your vocabulary has come to an end. When my son was 14 years old, I said to him every day from here on in until the end of year, you need to learn a new word. You need to learn the word and tell me what it means because I understand that the level of your understanding of language will determine how far you can go. Your IQ increases to the proportion that you word, learn new words. Are you understanding? There's a language of business. And if you do not understand it, then you cannot participate. That's why when the financial news comes on, you switch over to generations. Because it's simpler. There's a language of politics. There's a language of love. Are you understanding? There's a way to speak to a woman that will make her agree with what you're saying. Because they are gentle. When I was 16 years old, I said to my wife, you're going to be my wife. She said, no. I said, I said I'm telling you, listen. I started reciting poetry for her under the stars.
Because that's one area where force does not work. The language of the boardroom is not the language of the street. The language of the courtyard is not the language of the palace. You want to stand with kings and you say, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? And you're sagging. Your trousers are here. Let me tell you something. The way you, the way you dress is the way you'll be addressed. You see me sweating up here in a three-piece suit. You think I don't have any shorts? Number five, the Bible says concerning David, he was a handsome man. It's important to be handsome. Somebody say, I'm handsome. No, if you can't say it for yourself, you've got a problem. Say, I'm handsome. Somebody says, Pastor, but I don't feel handsome. Because the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I feel like I'm more fearful than wonderful. But I have come to understand something. Sometimes it's not what you have, it's what you do with what you've got. It's the ability to wake up in the morning and brush your teeth. Comb your hair. Find a suit that suits you. Talk with confidence. Are you listening to me? You know, my wife said something to me when I first got married. She said to me, listen, in this home, we bath twice a day every day. And I was a young man. I said, no, it's not happening. Because where I come from, I bath when I want to. <laughs> and my wife said to me, if you don't bath, there's no promised land for you. You understand what I'm saying? So I said, oh my God. I believe I receive the anointing to bath twice a day. When you dress well, when you smell good, find some money, save some money, buy that nice perfume. They say it's expensive for a reason. But when you wear it, oh man, you smell good. People respect you. People want to do business with you. I've done business deals when I didn't have a penny in my pocket, but I looked the part and they believed me. Because how you dress is how you will be addressed. Are uh, you understanding what I'm saying? Saints, let me tell you something. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Made in the image of God. There are people in the Bible who are handsome. I don't, I don't deny. I mean, David was a handsome boy. Absalom was handsome. Solomon was handsome. Abs you know, even, even the Bible says concerning uh, Joseph, he was so handsome that when Potiphar's wife looked at him, she said, I believe I receive. Are you understanding? <laughs> but we do what we can with what we've got. And the women said, because when a man is di disciplined and he's focused on how he looks, it makes his woman feel better about herself. She says, my man is going somewhere. Are you understanding me? We can't have your underwear with skid marks and you're a child of God. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And finally, as I draw to a close, and the Lord is with him. Saints, let me tell you something. When God is with you, who can be against you? John the Baptist said today, when was the last time you took time out to go and pray and fast and seek the Lord? Because one of the things that you must understand is that intimacy with God is never wasted. You want to be powerful in your generation? You cannot be powerful by yourself. There are limits to what you can do. There are limits to where you can go. But when God is on your side, 
That's why Moses would say, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. If you don't want me to have it, may I never have it. The presence of God. There's nothing shameful about a man worshiping God. Being intimate with God. Singing love songs to God. Lord, how I love you. I adore you. You see a man like David being distinguished, you think it's an accident. It's because he knew his God. The Bible says even concerning Joseph, even when he was in prison, the Lord was with him and he was a prosperous man. I don't know where you are today. My time is up. But what I know is that if you develop your skill, if you become a mighty man of valor, if you become a man of war, if you learn how to be prudent in speech, if you develop your handsomeness, and if you cultivate your relationship with the Lord, nothing shall be impossible to you. Saints, it's time for the body of Christ to arise. Jesus paid a heavy price for us to be where we are today.